Hello! Welcome to Too Fond of Books. My name is Janelle and I need to apologize right off the top because this video could very well be a hot mess. <laughs> so, first of all, I nearly poked my eye out putting my mascara on for some reason. Uh, second, I have very bad allergies today so I may be doing a lot of throat clearing and sniffing and so I apologize for that. Also, my husband's in the office uh, on a whole bunch of business calls, so you may hear some noise from that. And my mother-in-law is using her sewing machine in the basement, so there may be a lot of noise in the middle of this video, but you're gonna wanna stick around because this is going to be a big, juicy library book haul. So, stay with me, because it's gonna be awesome. Okay, so here is my stack of library books, and I'm going to pull these out and show them to you um, and do a bit of a library book haul, but I just thought I'd show you this stack here because I think it's hilarious. This is the spot where I tend to keep my library books. I have to keep them separate from our other books, and since our books that we own are already spilling off the shelves and have piles on the floor. I need to keep them in their own special spot. So this is where I keep my my library books. Now I'm going to zoom in a bit here uh, and uh, go in a little bit closer so you can see. Here's the pile from the top of uh, <laughs> of my library books. All right, so let's get into this. I'm going to pull these out and uh, show you my library book haul. I normally go crazy and take a whole bunch of books out from the library anyway, um, even though I try not to. Sometimes I foolishly limit myself to like 10 books out at a time and I never stick to that limit. So I have like 45 books here. Um, and then of course, because the libraries are closed, this actually worked out really well. I had books that I'd taken out anyway from a browse, and then I had a whole bunch of holds come in at the same time, and then uh, just in the various, uh, for various reasons, um, I hadn't taken certain books back yet, whatever. Anyway, I have this stack of, of 45 books from the library, so I have plenty to read uh, during the quarantine, so that's okay. So let's just get started. This is The Body in the Dumb River, a Yorkshire mystery by George Belairs. It is one of the British Library crime classics, um, and I've read it a little bit by George Belairs, and I, I quite enjoy his books. This is about a body has been found stabbed in the back near Eli, uh, miles from his Yorkshire home. His body clearly dumped in the unusually silent, quote, dumb river, has been discovered before the killer intended, disturbed by a torrential flood in the night. So a good old classic mystery there. I have The Girl Who Came Home, a novel of the Titanic by... Hazel Gaynor. I love when the library puts their stickers and then they completely cover over like the author's name or, you know, other stuff. I understand they have a limited number of places they can put their stickers, but still. Anyway, um, this is a book that I heard about um, on BookTube, possibly from Krista at Books and Jams, I think. Um, I'm very interested in that time period of the Titanic, and so I thought I'd give this one a try. Uh, this is A Short History of Tractors in Ukrainian by Marina Luchka. Luit? Luitka? Sorry, I'm totally butchering that name. And this, uh, this is about a man um, who is, I think he's like 80, and he decides to get married to like a 30 year old Ukrainian woman and his daughters are not impressed. Apparently it's supposed to be quite funny. A Flaw in the Blood by Stephanie Barron. She wrote the, um, the mysteries about Jane Austen, uh, which I haven't read. I think I wrote, I read one years ago and then just kind of forgot about the series, but this is a standalone, I think. It's not part of the Jane Austen series, 
Um, this is set at Windsor Castle in 1861. And it is a suspense novel centered around Queen Victoria's troubled court and a secret so dangerous it could topple thrones. Ooh, sounds good. Grace Hammer, a novel of the Victorian underworld by Sarah Stockbridge. I love the Victorian time period for historical books and uh, this just seemed interesting. An engrossing suspense novel set in Victorian London about stolen fortunes, romance, murder, and revenge. Lisa Genova, Still Alice. I've never read this book, but the premise sounded really interesting, and I thought that a book about uh, someone experiencing early onset Alzheimer's, written from um, an author who, who is, she's a neuroscientist, I think? Yes, she's a neuroscientist uh, with a lot of knowledge, and so I thought that made for an interesting premise. The question, of course, is whether Lisa Genova can write a book, can write fiction as opposed to nonfiction. But still, it sounded really interesting, so I'm going to give Still Alice a try. Uh, this is The Tokyo Zodiac Murders by... Hang on... Soji Shimada. Sorry, this cover is great, but really hard to read. I don't know if you can see that. So I can't even tell if the author's name is on the front. Oh, yes, it is. But it's just very hard to, to, uh, to see. So, Japan, 1936. An old eccentric artist living surrounded by seven women has been found dead in a room locked from the inside in his testament, alchemy, astrology, and a complicated plan to kill these women. Soon after, the plan is carried out. The seven women are found dismembered and buried across rural Japan. By 1979, these Tokyo Zodiac murders have been obsessing a nation for decades, but none of them has been solved. A mystery-obsessed illustrator and a talented astrologer set off around the country, and you follow, pursuing the enigma of the Zodiac murderer through madness, missed leads, and magic tricks. You have all the clues, but can you solve the mystery before they do? Yeah, this one sounded interesting because it combines elements of the golden age of detective fiction with fair play and a challenge to the reader, but apparently it is also like quite gory. There's grisly violence and stuff, so this intrigued me. Also, it's been translated from the Japanese. I believe. Does it say who does the translation? Let me see. Yes, translation by Ross, Ross and Shika McKenzie. Um, and so I'm doing an Around the World Reading Challenge, so this will be great for Japan in my reading challenge. Donald James. Walking the Shadows. I've never read anything by this author, and I can't remember what drew my attention to this book, um, except the, the little tagline on the front looks good. His past was a lie, his present a mystery. There is a drowned village in the south of France called Saint-Just, a village where secrets were buried in the Second World War, a village swiftly coming back into the light of day as a summer drought empties the reservoir that hides it. Ah, I can totally see why that would interest me. I am fascinated by villages that are drowned in order to create reservoirs. I think that is so interesting. Um, also, secrets buried in the Second World War, mm, also very interesting. Tom Chapel comes to St. Just to discover why a local man, Marcel Coutard, has left his $28 million fortune to his daughter Romilly, uh, and why shortly after his bequest, Romilly was abducted and attacked and left in a life-threatening coma. The local police are not forthcoming. There is a code of silence about Romilly and another dead girl, a silence which suggests a deeper and abiding mystery that Tom must uncover. His search takes him back to when this part of France was ruled by the Vichy government 
at odds with the resistance fighters who struggled to smuggle Jews away to safety, Tom included. Yet not all the Jewish, Jewish women made it. Some were betrayed, but by whom? Um, who amongst the French people he meets could be harboring a cold-blooded killer who 40 years later is prepared to kill and kill again to preserve his secret? I think I need to read this right away. This sounds so good. <laughs> this was published in 2003. The Girl from the Train by Irma Joubert, I think. Um, and this, I also heard about this from Krista at Books and Jams. Six-year-old Gretel Schmidt is on a train bound for Auschwitz. Jacob Kowalski is planting a bomb on the tracks. As World War II draws to a close, Jacob fights with the Polish resistance against the crushing forces of Germany and Russia. They intend to destroy a German troop transport, but Gretel's unscheduled train reaches the bomb first. Gretel is the only survivor. Though spared from the concentration camp, the orphaned German Jew finds herself lost in a country hostile to her people. When Jacob discovers her, guilt and fatherly compassion prompt him to take her in. For three years, the young man and little girl form a bond over the secrets they must hide from his Catholic family. But she can't stay with him forever. Jacob sends Gretel to South Africa, where German war orphans are promised bright futures with adoptive Protestant families. So long as Gretel's Jewish roots, Catholic education, and connections to communist Poland are never discovered. So... Excuse me. Separated by continents, politics, religion, language, and years, Jacob and Gretel will likely never see each other again. But the events they have both survived and their belief in the human, that the human spirit can triumph over the ravages of war have formed a bond of love that no circumstances can overcome. There is so much in there that sounds really interesting. Black Water Lilies by Michael or Michelle Busi. I heard about this book from um, Catherine at uh, Jane Catherine on Books, and she raved about this book, and it sounded so interesting. It is set in France. During the day, the town is the home of the mo famous artist Claude Monet and the gardens where he painted his water lilies. But once the tourists have gone, there is a darker side to the peaceful French village. This is the story of 13 days that began begin with one murder and end with another. Jerome Marval, Marval, a man whose passion for art was matched only by his passion for women, has been found dead in the stream that runs through Monet's gardens. In his pocket is a postcard of Monet's water lilies with the words, 11 years old, happy birthday. Entangled in the mystery are three women, a young painting prodigy, the seductive school village school teacher, and an old widow who watches over the village from a mill by the stream. All three of them share a secret, but what do they know about the discovery of Jerome Morval's corpse, and what is the connection to the mysterious rumored painting of black water lilies? Sounds really good. The Traitor by V.S. Alexander. This is a new, a new book out. Yeah, 2020 release. A novel inspired by the daring true story of the White Rose. This is a World War II fiction drawing on the true story of the White Rose, the resistance movement of young Germans against the Nazi regime. The traitor tells of one woman who offers her life in the ultimate battle against tyranny during one of history's darkest hours. Sounds really good. The Singapore School of Villainy and Inspector Singh Investigates by Shimini Flint. I've been really enjoying this series. This is the third one in the series. And um, I picked these up. Originally, the first one was set in Malaysia. And so it was part of my Around the World Reading Challenge. And it's working out great because he's from Singapore. But in the first book, he gets sent to Malaysia. Uh, in the second book, he gets sent to Bali. And in this book, he stays in Singapore. So this one series has allowed me to uh, mark three countries off on my Around the World Challenge. So that's great. The Watercolorist by Beatrice Massini. Look at that cover. Isn't that great? 19th century Italy. A young woman arrives at a beautiful villa in the countryside outside Milan. Bianca, a gifted young watercolorist, has been commissioned to illustrate the plants in the magnificent grounds. 
She settles into her grand new home, invited into the heart of the family by the eccentric poet Don Tita, his five children, his elegant and delicate wife, and controlling mother. As the seasons pass, the young watercolorist develops her art, inspired by the landscape around her, and attracts many admirers. And while most of the household servants view her with envy, she soon develops a special affection for one maid who, she is intrigued to learn, has mysterious origins. But as Bianca's determination to unlock the secrets of the villa grows, she little notices the dangers that lie all around her. Who is the mysterious woman she has glimpsed in the gardens? What could Don Tita and his friends be whispering about so furtively? And while Bianca watches so carefully for clues, who is watching her? Uh, and then I, I also grabbed Alexander McCall Smith's Emma. He does a modern retelling. A friend of mine recently read this and recommended it, so I grabbed it from the library. Murder in the Afternoon, Francis Brody. This is a Kate Shackleton mystery. I believe it's the third one now in the series. I've been enjoying this series. Yeah, it's the third one. They're set in the 20s, and... Um, her husband was declared, um, uh, I think, missing in action. Like, sh they never found his body. It's, it's probably, you know, he's probably dead, but she never had that assurance. And so I'm sure that makes life very complicated for her. But anyway, uh, she's, she starts doing an investigations. And so this one, um, this one is actually set in a mining community, I believe. Harriet and her brother Austin have always been scared of the quarry where their stonemason father works, but when they find him dead on the cold ground, they rush off quickly to look for some help. When help arrives, however, the quarry is deserted and there is no sign of the body. Were the children mistaken? Is their father not dead? Did he simply get up and run away? It seems like another unusual case requiring the expertise of Kate Shackleton. And Mary Jane, the children's mother, is adamant that only she can help. But Mary Jane is hiding something, a secret from Kate's past that raises the stakes and puts both Kate and her family at risk. Singapore Sapphire by uh, A.M. Stewart, I think. Yes, A.M. Stewart. Uh, I heard about this um, from, I think it was Hardcover Hearts uh, on that channel. She talked about this book recently. Um, early 20th century Singapore is a place where a person can disappear and Harriet Gordon hopes to make a new life for herself there, leaving her tragic memories behind her, but murder gets in the way. Singapore 1910. Sounds great. This is Simon Brett's The Body on the Beach. It's the first in the Feathering Village mystery and this one just sounded really fun. This is uh, from a while ago now. Let's see. 2000. He published this in 2000. But our main character, Carol Seedon, she's recently retired from the home office and she's living in Feathering and she discovers a body on the beach. And so she goes to find the police and when the police get there, the body's gone. And so it's a situation where the police don't believe her. They think she's just, you know, um, making it up or looking for attention or something. And so, yeah, that sounds really good. Marilla of Green Gables by Sarah McCoy. This is a uh, story that tells about the younger Marilla, which sounds really interesting. And uh, this is Green Gables. And I've been here, my husband and I went to visit uh, some friends of ours who live on PEI, Prince Edward Island, a few years ago. And uh, we went and visited Green Gables and walked all around and we saw L.M. Montgomery's um, homestead and everything. So. Yeah, I'm interested to see what this author does with the story of Merla. A Gentleman in Moscow by Amor Tolls. Um, this has been going around booktube, of course, uh, but this just sounds really interesting. It's set in 1922, or it starts in 1922, and Count Alexander Rostov is put under house arrest in a hotel in... Um, uh, right across from the Kremlin so it's gonna be um, oh my goodness I've just completely blanked <laughs> wait for it wait for it okay
doesn't matter. Anyway, he's in a hotel that is right across from the Kremlin, and so because he is under house arrest, he just sees um, some years of what, what goes on in uh, Russia during that time period, and it just sounds really interesting. Uh, Jane Fairfax by Joan Aiken. This is uh, a story, a continuation, let us say, of um, uh, Emma, and it just sounds it just sounds really good. So um, I'm not sure if it's a continuation or if it's just it's telling the story of Jane Fairfax um, from uh, the from the book of em, uh, Emma by Jane Austen. She wrote this in 1990, and so I'm just curious to see what she does with that. Uh, and then, of course, because I do what I do, and I just got a whole bunch of Joan Aiken books out, and this is called The Youngest Miss Ward, and this is, um, yeah, so this is a, a story around Mansfield Park, but um, it's about Harriet Ward, known as Hattie, by her sisters, Lady Bertram and Mrs. Mrs. Norris of Jane Austen's Mansfield Park. I also picked up Tracy Chevalier's A Single Thread. I believe this is her newest book, uh, well, 2019. It's set in 1932, a powerful, moving story of a woman coming into her own at the dawn of the Second World War. Secrets of a Charmed Life by Susan Meisner. Again, this is, I think this is another World War II book. Yeah, present day Oxford, a young American scholar, Kendra Van Zant, eager to pursue her vision of a perfect life, interviews Isabel McFarland just when the elderly woman is ready to give up secrets about the war she has kept for decades, beginning with who she really is. When Kendra receives from Isabel both a gift and a burden, one that will test her convictions and her heart. 1940s England, as Hitler wages an unprecedented war against London's civilian population, hundreds of thousands of children are excavated excavated, <laughs> evacuated to foster homes in the rural countryside. But even as 15-year-old Emmy Downtree and her much younger sister Julia find refuge in the charming Cotswold cottage, Emmy's burning ambition to return to the city and apprentice with a fashion designer pits her against Julia's profound need for her sister's presence. Acting at cross purposes just as the Luftwaffe rains down its terrible destruction, the sisters are cruelly separated and their lives are transformed. So you can see there's quite a lot of World War II fiction. I think I'm in a bit of a, uh, <laughs> a mood here. Jane and the Unpleasantness at Scargrave Manor by Stephanie Barron. This is the first Jane Austen mystery. So I had a Stephanie Barron earlier and I think that um, kind of reminded me of the Jane Austen series. So I got the first one out uh, just to check it out and see what I think of a, a mystery series with Jane Austen as a character. This is Summertime All the Cats Are Bored by Philippe Georgette. This is translated from the French. In the middle, it's the middle of a long hot summer on the French Mediterranean shore and the town is teeming with tourists. Sibag and Molino, two tired cops, are being slowly devoured by dull routine and family worries. Deal with the day's misdemeanors and petty complaints at the Perpignan Police Headquarters. But then a young Dutch woman is found murdered on a beach at Argel and another disappears without a trace in the alleys of the city. Is it a serial killer obsessed with Dutch women? Maybe. The media senses fresh meat and moves in for the frenzy the feeding frenzy. So again, this is a translated work, uh, great for my around the world reading challenge. The Escape Room by Megan Golden. This is a potentially a modern day locked room mystery. Uh, it's her debut novel, four young Wall Street rising stars discover the price of ambition when an escape room challenge turns into a lethal game of revenge. Welcome to the escape room. Your goal is simple, get out alive. Oh, and this is Girl at War by Sarah Novick, uh, another, oh, I was going to say another World War II fiction, but it's not. This is actually one about the Bosnian War, which I haven't read a lot about, and I think that's very interesting. P 
part coming of age tale, part war saga, part story of love and memory, Girl at War is a debut novel at once haunting and hopeful, written with the power of truth. Zagreb 1991, and it's a dual timeline because it also takes place in New York in 2001. So this just sounds really interesting. Lost Girls by Angela Marsons. I've been enjoying this series. It's a D.I. Kim Stone novel. They, um, they can be sometimes a tad violent, but it's not too bad. I've been quite enjoying this series. Uh, D.I. Kim Stone is quite a complicated uh, detective, quite a complicated character, and I quite enjoy them. Um, two girls go missing, only one will return. The couple that offers the highest amount will see their daughter again. The losing couple will not. Make no mistake, one child will die. So yeah, this is Lost Girls. The Man Who Never Returned by Peter Quinn. This is set in um, August of 1930. In the first summer of the Great Depression, Joseph Force Crater, recently appointed a justice of the New York State Supreme Court by Governor Franklin Roosevelt, bid two dinner companions good night and hailed a cab. Off he went into history, myth, and urban legend. Judge Crater's disappearance remains the most enduring, fascinating, unsolved mystery in the Chronicles of Gotham. This book takes place in 1955, the silver anniversary of the judge's vanishing, and our main character investigates. So I always find it interesting when authors take a real-life event or unsolved crime and uh, write a story about it. 